Two friends, two pastors, two theologians, exploring God and the greatest mysteries of life. Unscripted. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterio. Today on Mysterion, we'll take a look at the devil inside you. The devil inside you. Especially you, Ethan. <laughs> no, seriously, this is going to be super trippy. We, it, it's so gonna keep be watching and listening, please. <laughs> this will be weird. It's Stay gonna, tuned. It's going to be It's gonna be really weird. It's going to be good stuff. We're going to be talking about Satan. We're going to be talking about eyes. We're talking about angels. angels. We're talking about all this stuff because... To be fair, eyes, not so weird. Until you talk about eyes. Be covering your whole body. Yeah, and, that's a little weird. And wheels. We're going to be talking about wheels. Also not weird until... <laughs> until they're on your body with the and eyeballs. And they're angel weir- wheels. Yeah, it's true. So you guys sit back and relax. If you're in Oregon or Colorado, you know what to do. <laughs> this has got to be some drippy stuff, man. It's going to be really good. We are on number eight. We are on the eight passions here. And this is the... The height, we reach the apex of those thoughts that draw us away from the life of Christ. And we've reached, we're going to talk about the one that creates the most destruction. Yeah, today. I mean, uh, Vagrius says the other ones are demonic, but this one, he says, is it's satanic. It's downright. Luciferian. Luciferian. Yes. Yeah, so um, we're going to figure out why. We're going to find out why. And, and it's the one we all have and can't shake the most. So it's a real positive day on Mysterio. <laughs> happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy. the devil inside you. You know what's You know what's great about this stuff, though? Is it, I mean, it's not only is it trippy, but actually it starts to bring all of these things together. It does. Um, and really, str- all, you know, these strange images and wonderful images that we have about the angelic beings and also mm-hmm. Lucifer, the nature and the life of God, and why pride is top on the list. All of it converges, and it's like, oh, my gosh, this all makes sense. I mean, it's trippy, but it makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, which is even more it's mind-blowing. It's trippy sense. It's trippy sense. Trippy it really is. devil sense. Yeah. So I think the first thing we probably need to do is, because we've got a lot to talk about, maybe we'll hit a Viagrius first. It's real short. We'll mention what he has to say about pride. Yeah. And then we'll we'll go into, we'll get into some of this stuff with Macarius and uh, yeah. with um, Ezekiel. Sound good? Mm-hmm. You like that idea? I like, yeah, that's a good order. I All like right. I like now, it. here we go. So, we are going to start off with chapter 14 of Evagrius Practicus. He says, and I quote, The demon of pride is the cause of the most damaging fall for the soul. For it induces the monk to deny that God is his helper and to consider that he himself is the cause of virtuous actions. Further, he gets a big head in regard to the brethren, considering them stupid because they do not have all they they do not all have the same this same opinion of him. Anger and sadness follow on the heels of this demon, and last of all, there comes in its train the greatest of maladies, derangement of the mind, associated with wild cravings and hallucinations of whole multitudes of demons in the sky. This is wild stuff. So we have here, pride Mm -hmm. ends with derangement and hallucinations. And I think maybe by the end, we'll understand why. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's just like a water cannon it's weird to go after it we haven't even gotten to the really we haven't weird. even started yet man this is we are real this is gonna be a fun ride so so last week we talked about vain glory vain glory is this empty glory hey look at me i'm so great and it said we said and vagria said that can lead to uh anger or sadness it can lead to anger excuse me sadness or pride mm-hmm it leads to sadness if that gets frustrated. It leads to pride if it gets satisfied. Hey, look at me. And then all of a sudden we become proud. Then mm-hmm. I have to say to myself, hey, look at me. Mm-hmm. Not to you, but to me, yes. right? And that's pride. And pride, he says, leads to uh, anger or sadness when that gets frustrated. And to derangement and weird Yeah, so, and- so really vainglory is looking for, hoping that other people will turn their gaze toward me. Mm-hmm. 
to see my glory. Mm -hmm. And he says that leads to pride. So, but how does it lead to pride? This is the issue. Let's go to pride. Let's go to the word. Yes, let's do that. That Evagrius actually uses that. We translate pride and we'll begin to understand why the culmination is this word. And the word that he, that the, the Greek word that he uses um, here is huper phenea. Yeah. Okay, huper phenea. Now, phenea, you guys, we've used this word before, okay? It means appearance. It means appearance. So we've had a theophany. That's the appearance of God. Theophania. Theophania is an appearance of God. A Christophany is the appearance of Christ the Savior, right? An epiphany is... Um, an is, appearance of an epi. Is, yeah, is an, ep, is an epi appearance. So mm-hmm. there we go. So we have... This phanea is this word of appearance. Mm-hmm. Now, pride is hooper phanea mm-hmm. or hyper Yeah, phenea. that's where we get our English word for hyper or overdone, hyper, uper. So what's going on there? What's it so it's like this um, self-regarding hyper sense of oneself to, to in a sense... Um, Appear glorious, appear or glorious, appear right? Appear to be something of worth, yes, and we have right. here. Remember, he does not. He does not. He denies God his his helper. I don't right. need help. Look, look at what I right. the strength of the. So, going. so you look away from the theophania, yes. the Christophany, to the hooperphania of self of so, me. Yes, and this is actually where we get to Satan, right? Right. Because for Evagrius, not it's not in the Practicus, but in his other writings, to him the first sin, the verse, the first problem is Lucifer's pride, in which he tried to make of himself a spectacle that rivals the great theophany, the divine glory itself. He gets this from Scripture, right? This is a very scripture. traditional mm-hmm. Christian interpretation. Um, of Isaiah, right? That's right. Isaiah 14, uh, 12 through 14. Uh, Evagrius takes this to be about Satan or Lucifer, and I think rightly so, but that's a long argument. Uh, and it reads this way. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have, you have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars or angels of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Mm. So it's not simply that he is going to be like God and have a throne, but he's going to be this spectacle, this great appearance. He'll be like the glory on his throne. Yes. So for for so here again, Lucifer, the angel of light, his the say that the the, the, so the cause of this is pride, but mm-hmm. pride as huperphenia. Look at me. I'm going to ascend mm-hmm. to the high the the high point above the heavens. Right. Look mm-hmm. at my glory. That that sense of desiring, um, de, uh, recognizing in myself my own glory. His mm-hmm. eyes. The eyes of his own heart, we'd say, of his angelic heart, have been have turned inward on himself. And it's interesting, this image of ascending above the stars or above the angels, because that's in direct contradistinction, as we'll see, to the visions of God in heaven the prophets have, where they sit, ju- where the Lord himself, the divine glory, sits just above the angels, on them as on a throne. Mm-hmm. Lucifer desires to sit himself down in the same way. Uh, what is interesting, of course, is we, we understand this is the source of the fall, like he's cast out of heaven. Yes. Uh, because yes. of this. So, so the, the most damaging of the eight, pride, is this, this sense of wanting to, again, huper phenea, looking at myself, turning toward myself, turning the eyes of my heart inward toward myself to recognize, to see my own glory, Mm -hmm. and that will be his fall. And this is, again, he wants to duplicate or Mm -hmm. replicate this within us. So Evagrius says it leads to anger, Mm -hmm. right? And then so the imagery for Evagrius is Lucifer is cast out of heaven because of this. And he's angry at the image bearers, the humans. Mm-hmm. Right? And so he goes to re- to duplicate this. He wants to turn humanity into what he is. So what is what is the first temptation, of course, in the garden? 
which is you will become like God. You will become God without God. It's the same tempt the same temptation he gave yes. into is now what he's drawing the human race into. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. So just as he was cast out of the heavenly temple because of this, so the the humans are tempted by this and they are cast out of the cosmic temple, which is the Garden of Eden, that yes. original temple that we've talked about here before, they're cast out as well. And now we find in throughout our lives the same temptation. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Pride itself, the thought, the logismi, right? The mm-hmm. thought, the passion is trying to draw us away mm-hmm. from the presence of Christ, just as in the beginning, by instilling within us the thought that we would turn toward ourself, mm-hmm. right? And in that sense, um, regard our own self, uh, the glory of our own self. Now, why we're gonna have to figure out why is that so dangerous, mm-hmm. and how does that connect with this, even this bigger picture of the purpose of all of the angels and yeah. all created beings? So, I mean, so excuse me, we should talk about what we actually have in common with the angels. Yes, they are created spirit, and so are we. Mm-hmm. Even if we have fleshly bodies and they don't, we are created spirit, which means, in a very real sense, we're designed for the same thing. Yes. Which is the vision of God. Yes. To be, so to speak, these pure receptacles of God's own glory, to be filled with that glory and have it overflow us towards others. Yes. Uh, and then that's that's borne out in a number of Old Testament and New Testament passages, really. Did we want to look at that? Yeah. So, so just to kind of get the map of what we're doing here, okay? Pride. Pride is the heart of pride, is hupa phenea. Look at at me mm-hmm. all right mm-hmm. look at me that is the that is the uh the great sin of satan mm-hmm. it was the fall of hum- humankind it is what's tempting us even now to cause the greatest destruction mm-hmm. and now we're going to turn toward an understanding a biblical understanding of what the angelic beings are for and what all spiritual rational creatures were created for to understand why that's so destructive. And and what we'll see is that it's not simply that pride is the worst because it comes from not just the demons but Satan himself, um, or that it's just the hardest to resist though it is, is also this idea that um, things like anger and lust and so forth, these are like symptoms of our illness. Pride itself is the perversion of what we're created for, yes. as we'll see, as we'll see. Okay, so now we're going to take another step into our trippy uh, magical mystery tour. Which means Ezekiel. Which means Ezekiel. The trippiest book of the Bible. Yes, so we're going it, to, it is the trippiest book of the Bible, pretty much, and Ezekiel's having a very uh, wild vision um, that begins, uh, that actually begins his prophetic work here, um, and we're going to be reading from a section of this vision that he describes in Ezekiel 10, and I think we're going to begin in 9 here, verse 9. Um, do you want to read it or you want me to read it? What do you want to do? Oh, sure, I'll read it. Okay. All right. So Ezekiel is having a vision. Okay. And he, he, he's having this vision. He's describing what he's seen, what he's seeing, and he says... I looked, and there were four wheels beside the cherubim. Cherubim is the name of the mighty angels closest to the throne of God, or actually they are the throne of God. I looked, and there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like gleaming barrel. And as for their appearance, the four looked alike, something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. But in whatever direction uh, the front wheel faced, the others followed without veering as they moved. Their entire body, their rims, their spokes, their wings, and the wheels, uh, the wheels of the four of them were full of eyes all around. As for the wheels, they were called, in my hearing, the wheels of work. Did I miss something? The wheel work. No, go ahead. Each one had four faces. The first face was that of the cherub. The second face was that of a human being. The third, that of a lion. The fourth, that of the eagle. Uh, Is that good? Yeah, yeah, we'll stop there. I mean, there's a lot more that he talks about in there in terms of his vision. Mm -hmm. But what we have is this vision of these really strange beings. Yes. Right? So 
He has this vision. His eyes are open Easy to on. the heavenly throne, the presence of God. And what we see when we're seeing the presence of God is these really strange beings that are eyes and wheels and faces. Mm-hmm. So what we find is there's a there are they are made of wheels. Okay. Mm-hmm. So first of all, what's the whole wheel imagery going on here in terms of the angelic beings? So these angelic beings, they're both angels, but they're also God's uh, throne which is a chariot throne, a merkaba, if you want to know the Hebrew word. It's a chariot throne. So there are wheels within wheels within wheels, and they've got wings, and they've got faces, and they've got wheels. But everything about them is covered in eyes, and they have four faces because in every direction that they look, it's a face. <laughs> this is so wild. Yeah. So, we, <laughs> so we were saying here that like, these angels are the throne of God. The presence of God rests upon these beings, okay? And these beings are also a chariot. So they're a yes. living, moving throne. Mm-hmm. And they can go any direction, mm-hmm. and wherever direction they go, they're facing mm-hmm. They're, 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 they're face, always, facing, they're always forward. facing forward. There's no behind them. There's no behind, and they're covered. Everything is covered in eyes. And we know from other visions in the Old Testament similar to this is they're also singing praises to God. Yes, yes. So, so it, it's they are a chariot covered in, with wings and wheels and eyes and faces, and their whole existence is, is adoring and praising the Lord. So, first of all, this is kind of frightening <laughs> oh no. we all we often think about being being in the presence of god and uh, you know this is this is whoa this is this is crazy stuff but let's talk a little about what this means and to do that mm-hmm. i think we're going to turn a little bit to macarius right yeah. mm-hmm. and then we'll end up going back to evagrius but um i i, I mean i don't want to tell so, you where to go but i think that yeah i we think we could for a second we get some sense of what's going on so here. let me say a couple of things the, the understanding here of course is that why covered in eyes and why faces face forward in all directions? Mm-hmm. Eyes and faces are symbols of attention, right? If you're talking to me and I'm looking away, you'll get offended because I'm not paying attention to you. That's right. Or my eyes aren't on you. Mm-hmm. So if I'm covered in eyes and every direction I face is, is, is my face um, or every, there is nothing behind my face, then I am a being of pure attention, mm-hmm. right? So... Th- The existence of the highest angels, their whole existence is to be utterly absorbed in the adoring of the presence of God. Yes. There's nothing about them that is not that. I have just two eyes. I just have one mind and one face. Their whole existence is attention to God. And, um, and wherever the presence goes, they are there, right? Because yes. that's the wheels. They're moving about. They never depart from the presence of God. They're always carrying mm. the presence of God this way. Mm. And whatever direction that they go, they're always facing the, the glory. They're immersed. Uh, utterly immersed. Uh, utterly immersed. And wherever and the glory them. is, they are there. Yes. The light of God shines through them. So they are literally carriers of God's presence because they're attending to it so completely. Yes. Right? So they're mm-hmm. paying such close attention. So uh, Macarius, there's this fellow Macarius. Actually, we need to talk about two people. There was one who was uh, a mentor of Evagrius himself in the desert. Mm-hmm. Some later monks would write under his name, not to steal his fame, but to humbly hide themselves, not gain attention. There was a guy who wrote under his name, we call him now Pseudo, as in not really, Macarius. And he was actually one of these Syrians that I often talk about, these Syrian Christians who was very, although not Jewish, was Semitic, and so very close to the biblical language. And this guy, Pseudo-Macarius, was very famous. And he has these famous 50 homilies or short sermons that he gave that are written for us. And the very first short sermon, homily number one, is a comment or an interpretation of passages like Ezekiel 1, which is another trippy vision just like this one mm-hmm. in Ezekiel 10. And he sees in these angels, which are created spirit like we are, an image of what you and I are supposed to become. So if these beings are strange and weird as being all eye and all face, carrying God's presence on them and within them, it gets even weirder when he says that's what we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But this is what he says. He says it's an image of the soul of the Christian and what the Christian should become. 
Pseudo Macarius says this about Ezekiel's vision. For the prophet was viewing the mystery of the human soul that would receive its Lord and would become his throne of glory. All kinds of New Testament passages about that. For the soul that is deemed judged worthy to participate in the light of the Holy Spirit by becoming his throne and habitation, remember Christ always talking about my Father and I will dwell in you, is covered with the beauty of the ineffable glory of the Spirit becomes all light, all face, all eye. There is no part of the soul that is not full of the spiritual eyes of light. That is to say, there is no part of the soul that is covered with darkness, but is totally covered with spiritual eyes of light. For the soul has no imperfect part, but is in every part, on all sides, facing forward, covered with the beauty of the ineffable glory of the light of Christ, who mounts and rides upon the soul. (laughs) This is so good. And then he goes on to say, Thus the soul is completely illumined with the unspeakable beauty of the glory of the light of the face of Christ, is is perfectly made a participator of the Holy Spirit, is privileged to be the dwelling place and the throne of God, all eye, all light, all face, all glory, and all spirit, and made so by Christ who drives, guides, carries and supports the soul about and adorns and decorates the soul with this spiritual beauty. Wow. So what we have here is Macaria is saying that Ezekiel's vision is, is actually at his deepest heart is a vision of what, what we are destined to be, what mm-hmm. God's desire for us is to be, is we ourselves, human beings, are meant to be chariot thrones. We are meant to be that vehicle upon which the, the glory, the presence of God rests. Wherever we go, the presence is there. Mm-hmm. And we ourselves are transformed spiritually to become covered in eyes. In other words, our whole being is open to the glory of God. I mean, you think about it. The eye is like a spiritual window. Right. Right. The light passes through it and into that dark room. Mm -hmm. If we become all eye, it's like sort of like becoming all windows. The room is going to be filled with light Mm -hmm. in that way. And and, and what what uh, what uh, Pseudomacarius is saying is that it's through the spirit, the Holy Spirit, that we become transformed such that we become the throne of Christ. Christ fills our very being with light because we become all I. Everything that we are is receiving the glory of God. So, I mean, you know, think about this. This is obviously riffing on what we talk about a lot on here about the fact that you and I are temples of Jesus Christ. That doesn't just mean, oh, you happen to carry his presence, but ultimately the goal is to have his revelation, to this knowledge of him overwhelm us. So again, let's think about this image of these angels that we have in the Old Testament. They are given over to the praise of the glory. The name of the great theophany, the appearance of God, is called the glory. And these ones who are all I, they praise the glory. You know the song that we sing in church, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty? That comes from them. That's their song. They are given entirely over to the praise of him who they adore. If you go back and read uh, Ephesians chapter 1 in the New Testament, praise of glory, Paul repeats that phrase Three, no less than three times in mm-hmm. half of a chapter. Mm-hmm. And then the result is that, quote, the eyes of your heart will be opened yes. and the revelation of Christ will descend into your heart. So what's happening in heaven is happening in you. You become So you become the holy, 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 holy. You're praising holy, holy, oh, holy. The ho- yeah. And the, the presence descends into you and you become filled with the light in within your heart. Yes. The light so, of God's So just like the angels, heart. right? They're totally consumed with praising the glory and therefore seeing the glory and being filled with his light. This too is what we're called to. So, so within that context, all spiritual creatures are created to be this way. Now we can begin to understand why Lucifer's I will ascend, I will become, I will sit above the heavens, why that is a great fall, Mm -hmm. why that itself is the great um, destruction, as uh, Vagrius calls it. It is the most destructive. Mm -hmm. And because, again, if Satan, Lucifer, was an angelic being, Mm -hmm. his 
purpose was to be filled with the light of God, to carry the glory of God. But what happened was there was this turning towards his own, remember, huperphenia, right? Mm -hmm. The sense of look at who I am and think about this as sense. There's a sense in which if he was at one point all I, yeah. those eyes began again to close well, to the glory of God. I mean, he's God, often right? symbolized as a serpent. And the other word for the cherubim is seraphim, which mm -hmm. can mean serpent, mm -hmm. right? Um so yeah, and so and again, so he, like us, we are created to be filled with divine light, the light of a God, but it's mm -hmm. Christ's own light. Yes. And it's precisely by being all of I, by being totally absorbed in his light, that it comes in through our eyes and we're filled. What Satan does is he turns away from that. He turns the eyes back upon himself, which darkens his eyes. And he's no longer flooded with God's own light. So, and 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 again, if we could spend some time exploring why is it why is it when we talk about the demonic and the devils and the places it is a place of darkness, darkness, right? Mm -hmm. so in the sense in which the place of light is a place where our eyes are open to the glory mm -hmm. of God. Darkness mm -hmm. is a turning away the, from the light of God. And this is heaven. why in the Garden of Eden, the whole debate. The whole thing is whether you will uh, share with God in his life, his divine life, mm -hmm. or you will try to be a God on your own mm -hmm. and therefore fall and mm -hmm. fall into darkness and be cast out of the presence. So, yes. So we, we're going to get into a little bit more about what this looks like practically yes. and spiritually. But before we do that, I, I want us to touch on this really mm -hmm. quick because I think there's a, an important point of clarification we need to make. Um, later on... Um, and we see this very popular today. It's very prevalent, almost assumed today in especially Protestant um, evangelical churches is this picture that Satan falls, we can fall. The great sin of uh, pride is there because God desires all the glory mm -hmm. and we're sort of taking the glory from God and God's jealous of his own glory. Right. And so the great fall is God is really God saying, This glory belongs to me, right? Don't take any of it from me. And that's why pride is so bad. Because really what 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 God demands all of the glory. But in fact, the more ancient interpretation of this is nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And what the fathers are go going to argue is it is not that God is just jealous of his own glory, but there's something about the very nature and the life of God mm -hmm. um, that we are denying when we take up this huperphenia or mm -hmm. this pride. Um, do you want to, I, I, I well, know we need to flesh that to out, but yeah. That. Like, I mean, one, so the point is not that you uh, don't grasp for glory. The point is to let yourself be filled with God's glory. So it's not about jealousy at all. In fact, it's God is not being jealous of his glory. He wants to share his glory, which is precisely why turning away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, as Christians, we're, throw around another big word, we're Trinitarians. We believe in a God who is himself fundamentally the sharing of glory. The Father gives everything he has to his Son. Mm -hmm. They share that with the Spirit, and the life of God is spilling out of that communion between them to us. Mm -hmm. So it's not about jealousy and guarding. The idea is being filled with a glory that is fundamentally love. It's fundamentally shared. It's given away. It's a glory of, of, of paying attention to another, to be filled with that other one's life. Mm -hmm. And so turning away to oneself is a denial of that. Mm -hmm. So God isn't just saying, hey, 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 I'm the glorious one. You, you need to die now because you haven't recognized that. It's precisely a turning away from the sharing of a glory that's essentially, think about this, God has always been a sharing. Yes. A love between Father, Son, and Spirit. So yeah, let me, just to flesh this out, to give a sense of what we're talking about here in terms of uh, uh, biblically, when Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to just refer to Jesus's mm -hmm. prayer in the Gospel of John chapter 17, listen to the way he talks about the relationship between himself as the Son and the Father, mm -hmm. the glory that's being shared and the love that's being mm -hmm. shared that he's calling us into. So in, in, in verse, and in, in, I'm going to talk, uh, I'll start in verse 3. Um, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. Again, mm -hmm. we might be in a talk there that you'd be all I, mm -hmm. that you'd be able to receive everything. Yes. This is what eternal life is, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 
I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to get into all the details of that, but you see the sharing of glory, this back and forth sharing. The Father's glorifying the Son. The Son is glorifying the Father and in this, this way. this is even before the creation of the world. Even this, before, yes. This is the eternal life. This is the life of God to share glory. I have made your name known to those those who you gave me from the world they were yours and you gave them to me and they were and they have kept your word now they know that everything you have given me is is from you for the words that you gave me i have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that i came from you and they have believed that you sent me i am asking on their behalf i'm not asking on behalf of the world but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours all mine are yours and your Yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And we kind of continue on. The whole point here is uh, there's this constant giving and exchange of glory between the Father and the Son, and we are being invited in into that. Mm-hmm. In fact, Jesus is praying for us that, as he says uh, later on in verse uh, 21, that they may be one as you, Father, in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world would know that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given them, so that they may be one as we are one. Mm-hmm. So there's this constant unity of exchanging of glory. The point is, is this, is that it seems to me that we could say, in, in a kind of metaphorical sense, the Father is all I toward the Son, mm-hmm. and the Son is all I, as in all seeing towards the Father. The Son, everything is being received and given over to the Father, right? In the bond of, mm-hmm. in the bond of the Spirit, in that mm-hmm. way, and that all the created beings were meant to share in this life of God, mm-hmm. of this mm-hmm. giving and exchanging of glory, and human beings were meant to be a part of that, too, yeah. right? We are meant to be all I, as God is completely selfless. Is Completely, completely giving, completely given over to the other, right? And yes. the other one is completely, completely paying attention. I mean, I, I just think about you know the great metaphor of marriage that gets marshaled uh, a few times in the Bible itself. I mean, you know, when you're really in love with that other person, you want to take them in with your eyes, and then you want to take them in with touch, and you just mm-hmm. want your whole being to be entirely receptive mm-hmm. to their presence. What this is saying is that is in fact what the highest angels already are, and this is what we're destined to be. You know, um, you know, Paul talks about when we are resurrected, we'll have spiritual bodies. Well, a spirit is life that's open to another. Yes. So someday, just like you know, with your loved one, you don't just look at their face; you want to hear them, and you want to skin to skin. Yes. You want to be entirely in their presence. This idea is we will be transformed such that our whole being, not just one little part of us, will be entirely open to the Lord, and that will flood us with His glory. Yes, and that will shine out of us, and that yes. will be love poured out to others. Yes. So. so to go, to return now to Evagrius and turn now and back to the passions with all of this in place, what we can begin to see. Remember what we said. Um, uh, it actually first first episode of this season um, that uh, the uh, love is the child um, of apatheia. The sense that love, remember, which is this compassion, this ability to turn toward other people. I I need to become clear. I need to become still. I need to become have that peace mm-hmm. such that I can really see what others need and I can respond to them. Remember, mm-hmm. this passion is required for compassion. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about glory, when we talk about re- being receptive, all this I stuff and all that, mm-hmm. what we're talking about spiritually is the nature of the nature of love. Mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. not turn toward myself, my own desires, my own ambitions, my own needs. All of that is this turning towards, that's huper finea, Mm -hmm. right? What we have instead here is completely turn toward, my whole being is open toward to receive the light of God shining through others, To, to, to share, have compassion, to love them in that way. This is the very nature of God, to be completely turned toward, um, to completely be turned toward the other and being able to receive the glory and the light of, of the other in that way. Yeah, and this is Philippians 2 again, which we talked about last week. The mm-hmm. God who thinks nothing of himself, yes. who empties himself out entirely for us. Yes. Um, 
And uh, the, we're called to reciprocate that because that is joy and that is love. And then now we can see why pride is not just one issue amongst others. It's mm-hmm. the perversion of the very joyous life we were called into. Yes, I mean it's it's the very it's the very denial of the nature of God. It's the denial of love. It's the denial of love in that sense. So uh, now that we're gonna uh, maybe we can start to try to get into. I know this has been a real, like I said, kind of a magical <laughs> mystery tour. Um, but can we um, can we spend a little bit of time talking about what would it mean um, for us um, to overcome pride? Pride. It seems to me yeah. like pride is almost like a it's a, it's a it's a blinding thing. In the sense that if our spirit is meant to be all I, mm-hmm. right, it's meant to be completely open, it, it, it obscures that. Mm-hmm. It obscures that. Um, I think we could talk about it in terms of Evagrius and the nature of the human being and, mm-hmm. and, and noose as being what we, the very center of who we are. Um, we could talk about it that way, but we, uh, we also need to talk about some practical things too. So what what, uh, what would you, I'm, I'm kind of handing it over, where oh, would you like okay. to go with it? Like. Uh, well, let's let's talk about Evagrius just for a second, because uh, because some of our people who listen and watch are reading through this, and he uses very different language than Macarius, right? Mm-hmm. For him, there's this idea of the noose. You said the mind, the sort of highest point in us where we we understand, we we take in things, right? Mm-hmm. And that that is to be turned entirely uh, to the Lord, and we mm-hmm. are transformed by that. Which is why uh, to go back to something we've said a lot is repentance is in this world our way of life. Yeah. We we take that part of us that's able to attend to another, what's able to pay attention to God, and we keep turning it back away from the world or back away from ourselves in pride to the Lord. So repentance is key, right? Repentance is the key to get rid of pride, to empty ourselves out um, so that we can become love yeah. in this in this way. Um, so for Evagoras, just to real specifically to kind of refer mm-hmm. to, you know, in Evagoras's language, he doesn't use the the graphic scriptural imagery so much as uh, as much as Macarius does. Mm-hmm. He talks about the noose, which is that the term, the term when we translate mind or intellect. And, but he basically says that's the very heart of the human being. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. the very center of the human being. And he says the noose or the mind of the intellect is meant to be completely clear. Mm-hmm. In the sense that there's nothing obscuring it, there's no thoughts or ideas to get in the way between who I am and what God is. And it's, in other words, to turn the eyes of the heart completely over to the Lord, to mm-hmm. turn the eyes of the heart to the Lord. That's the purpose of human life. And when we do that, according to Evagrius, we become more and more like the angels. Mm-hmm. We become more and more like the cherubim and the seraphim. We become our our mode of life becomes angelic. Mm-hmm. But if we give way to the passions and most especially pride, what happens is is we take the path of the demonic. We take the mm-hmm. path and we mm-hmm. enter that state where our the eyes of our heart are turned in on themselves. We become obscured, we become filled with darkness mm-hmm. and we essentially fall from that glory which is love, the life mm-hmm. of God mm-hmm. in that way. And so all this passions, all the stuff that he's talking about, that's the context of it, mm-hmm. that we would slowly be ascend, to be raised up to the status, the place of the angels to become all I, that our noose, mm-hmm. the eyes of our heart would be completely clear mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. way. So, well, you know, and so to go back to Evagrius' view of what this is, so the difference between vainglory and pride, vainglory is, hey, look at me, I'm great. And pride is being convinced in yourself that apart from God you can do these things. And um, um, how do I say this? Uh, death is not so much a punishment. Life in this world that's difficult is not so much a punishment as a fairly severe mercy that teaches us that we are not sufficient in ourselves, right? So I think one way to deal with pride is to actually embrace our weaknesses. Because Evagrius says pride can lead to uh, sadness or anger, where you become convinced in yourself that you can do this without God, and then life teaches you something very differently. That can just give in to despair. You can get angry. You can get sad. Because life in this world, if, you know, if you're very focused on worldly goods and pleasures, those are all going to go away. Everything mm-hmm. will be taken from you. <clears throat> if, however, if we approach, not to be morbid, our dying— as an education, 
because it's really hard to dislodge pride. I can't just decide to not be prideful anymore because I've tried and I'm still proud. proud. Um, but we can embrace our weaknesses. We can embrace our illnesses as a kind of education. Mm-hmm. We will all be asked, we will all show our weakness, right? We will all be taught our weakness. Now, again, again, don't get the picture of the God who's like, I'll teach you. It's a, it's a severe mercy of let, let me teach you that without me, that you're darkness, you're not light, this pride. Mm-hmm. The point is to crack us open again, to turn our minds out towards God. And part of what that takes is to have it be demonstrated to us how weak we are without him. Yeah. The problem with the darkness within us is that we don't know it's there, and we need to know it. So we can mourn the bad and terrible things in this world. We can work for justice, and we should do all these things, but recognize there's a certain amount of suffering, there's a certain amount of just just weakness and dying and giving out that we can either despair over, be given over to anger or or sadness, as Vagar says, goes, or if we're repenting of pride, we can take that as a lesson. I am utterly mm-hmm. dependent on God. Mm-hmm. And when I'm completely poured out and I'm nothing but dust in the ground, well, we know what God does with dust in the ground. He makes human beings out of that. He will raise us up, and we will yeah. be filled with the love of God. So I think... We need to be patient with pride. Let's recognize, as terrible as it is, we called it demo- not just demonic, but satanic. But remember, it's always the humble one approaching us, trying to pull us out of this pride. Yeah. And two, we can actually embrace this life in this world that is dying as itself, that education mm-hmm. that will teach us our weakness so that we can be opened up to joy and life and eternal life and so forth. Yeah, just to speak about that, to touch on some of the images that you said um for myself, both mm. in prayer and then throughout my day, one mm. of the things that has helped me some with this is to tell my tell myself uh, and also profess this before the Lord in prayer, I'm two things. Every human being is two things. We are dust and we are the Spirit of God. Mm. So we are those, and this is the wonder of it, is to recognize at the same time both things are equally true. Mm-hmm. So I, I am dust and ashes from dust I came to dust I will return as you're saying I need I can learn I can fight it or I can embrace that I am dust mm-hmm. but I'm also the spirit of God I am the glory of God it's God's mm-hmm. glory and life in me that just turned this ball of dust particles mm-hmm. into something that shines his glory that gives his glory Earth and also to be, yeah, the earthen vessel, to hold those two things together as both equally true and not canceling each other out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That they both, in some sense, they complete one of their two sides of, of who I am. And to claim that about myself, to, to remind myself of that. And sometimes, you know, I need to be, I need to remind myself when I'm fighting pride, sometimes I need to remind myself that I'm dust and ashes. Mm-hmm. And I t- t- tell yourself that I am dust. When you feel that sense of um, ego coming up, mm-hmm. I am dust. And then also at times, I'm the spirit of God. When there's mm-hmm. that sense, uh, you know, and again, it's not my own dependence or my own strength, but it's God. I'm a vessel of the Spirit of God. I'm caring. I am a, even if my throne happens to be the chariot throne that I am, tends mm-hmm. to have some broken wheels and, you know, I'm having a hard time getting around that way. I'm not all I. I'm still mm-hmm. a chariot throne. I'm mm-hmm. still something uh, something that carries in some sense. I am the the vessel of the temple there of, mm-hmm. the, of the Spirit of God. And that practice of reminding myself of those two things, knowing that both are true, mm-hmm. Um, that one doesn't cancel out the other, but they complement mm-hmm. each other in, in who I am, is one of these things that helps me fight pride. Yeah, I mean, we are created for glory, God's glory, not ours, right? But it, it truly becomes ours, right? We become one body with Christ. We become one spirit with him. These are all uh, New Testament. Uh, these are all, that's all New Testament language. So uh, apart from him, we're nothing. We're dust. With him, we're utterly filled with the life of God. So mm-hmm. it's it's, and you know, and both of those things unite us to God. To go back to one of my my favorite passages in Second Corinthians, right? We carry about the dying of Christ, so that the living of Christ might be manifest also in our flesh. So, again, even in these hardships that we have to learn, uh, that no, you're not so great in yourself. You mm-hmm. and yourself, you're just dust. But with God, you these things. But even in learning that, we're being united mm-hmm. to the God who Himself became 
dust. Yeah. Um, and, and if 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 Evagrius is right, and pride, the superphenia, is at the core of all of the passions, you know, mm-hmm. um, if each one of these, if what we're talking about, whether it's a sadia or lust or gluttony or anger, they're kind of symptoms or manifestations of this one central thing. Then, you know, one of the ways that we can go back and look at how do we battle with gluttony or how do we battle with lust? Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be that that path of humility, that path of saying mm-hmm. um, that humility, I mean, humility, um, as we said last week, is this turning over. It, it is to see the theophany of God, mm-hmm. to humble ourselves and to see the theophany of God that way are two sides of the same coin. That humility is practiced in each one of those contexts is going to help us along the way. I'll just give mm-hmm. you an example. Like um, when I struggle with gluttony, and in fact, uh, 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 the the reminding of myself, reminding myself I am dust and ashes, but I am a vessel of, this, of the Spirit of God. I am animated. I'm alive because of the Spirit of God that that whatever that temptation is that i am faced with it puts it in that context and it makes those desires that i have it puts them in the right place right they're no longer Mm -hmm. uh carrying the day in terms of the story Mm -hmm. the general story is this is who i am Mm -hmm. this is what i'm suffering from and that gives me strength and clarity to fight that temptation same Mm -hmm. thing with anger i mean if i can remember and um remind myself even in the midst of feeling that temptation, that anger, the thoughts, this angry feelings arise. I am dust, and I care, but I carry the Spirit of God, right? Mm-hmm. That, that those things, again, it kind of begins to help give that context for, um, for anger, you know, because, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and we can go into the details of why that is, but I would say that that's something that has been helpful to me. Yeah, and I, gosh, we're running out of time. I mean, we could talk a lot about anger and sadness, which Evagoria says is where pride leads to help you diagnose. Like I, I talk with a lot of people, especially men who talk about, I have an anger issue. I have a, a short temper. How do I deal with that? Well, if Evagrius is right, probably the source of the temper is pride and your pride's being offended. So we need to go back to this idea. Without God, I'm dust. I'm nothing. But I mean everything to me. fills me with his life so that I'm not dependent on this sense of myself through my worldly accomplishments that people aren't, you know, giving their due, and so I get mad. So a good way to work on um, both anger and then a kind of sadness, which we don't have time to go into, I guess, uh, is to look at pride. Uh, I think we have an especially poisonous form of pride in our world today, where it's lodged more in what we're supposed to be and our destiny and how we're supposed to accomplish all these great things. And so it's this thing I'm supposed to be, and the only story I have to tell about why I'm not is my own failures or somebody has done something to me to block me. Um, And so we get sad, and we get depressed, and we get angry, like Mm -hmm. uh, precisely because we have this pride about what we're called to be. Well, what you're called to is to be this union of dust and God, Mm -hmm. and that is greater than everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about the mighty works of Paul. He wrote one-third of the New Testament— started all these churches, all this stuff. He himself says all those accomplishments is nothing. He would mm-hmm. give it all up. It's garbage compared mm-hmm. to that union of, of dust and God mm-hmm. that is his very self. Same thing with us. Mm-hmm. The Lord calls you to do these mighty works, you know, calls you. Well, that's great, but recognize there's this ocean of blessing that is your marriage to Jesus Christ, that is your union, that mixing of the dust of our bodies with God himself. And if you do some things in the world that get some notoriety, that's just a little drop of the ocean, right? Mm. And so I I, I think we have a kind of, we can have a poisonous church culture where we get people to do things. We have a language of calling that's rooted in a kind of pride. And just real quick, even Jesus himself echoed what Paul says there. You know, he sends the 72 out on a missionary journey. They come back all excited. We did this, and even the demons obeyed us. And Jesus' response is, do not rejoice in that. Rejoice simply that your names are written in heaven, right? That you have become that union of the dust that we are as humans and God. Uh, so this is one of those sneaky places, I think, in church life, this idea, oh, I have this mighty destiny. Maybe you do. Maybe you're called to convert an entire continent. That's a drop in the ocean of, of treasure that is that unity of, of, of dust and God that is in you. 
And that yes. is compared to that, it, it, compared to that, these mighty works compared to the, the great thing God has done in somebody who lives a quiet life, but they have that union in them. It's no greater. It's no less. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just to riff off that a little bit, I think, and tie it to what we've been talking yeah. about even a bit more is that the greatest, the greatest thing that we could accomplish is to be able to recognize God's presence and God's glory and give him glory for that. Mm-hmm. That's the angelic calling. Yes. Right. So to see, to be able to see God's presence and say, holy, 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 mm-hmm. you you fill this place. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, that's what our, that's what we were created for. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to, if we are really going to say, this is the greatest thing I could do is to become like the, the seraphim and the cherubim and just do that. I mean, they're not really doing anything I else, mean, but saying you are holy, you are present. And, um, um, just to tie that to, uh, for example, a spiritual discipline. I know that you've been taking the staff through this um, over the last few weeks, a spiritual discipline, where we've been asking the the ministry staff, throughout your day, remind yourself, Lord Jesus, you are here. Mm-hmm. Um, just tell yourself that as you walk into a room or as you um, get into your car, as you sit down to work at your desk, just say, Lord Jesus, you are here. That sounds very simple and but you're training the soul to become all I. Yeah. You're training the soul to recognize yeah. the presence of God wherever they are, to become that chariot throne that's mm-hmm. all I. Wherever you go, you recognize his glory that is there. Your eyes are open to see it. And that's the greatest calling mm-hmm. that we could receive in Christ. And we should glory in that, right? It's it's great if you have a sense of doing the Lord's work in your job or, or in your family or so forth. That That's fantastic. But your calling is Christ. The language of calling in the New Testament, when you really look at it closely every time, it's not for me to be a pastor or a theologian. My calling is Christ. Now, some of the blessing that God walks with me through is getting to be a pastor and so forth. But compared to what he's doing in all these people who have this union, like, that work is nothing. It'll pass. It'll go away. And it's very, it's a very tricky place to sort of undo pride, to see my identity and who I am in these kind of Christian works. Well, mm-hmm. it's not in these Christian works. It's in this union, right? And we want to turn our minds to that. We just want to receive the love of God and let it radiate out of us. That's it. You know what I mean? Um, I, we can rest in that. I think this is that's a story of liberation, freedom from the things that make us anxious, even in Christian life, or prideful and angry and sad. But What's fascinating about it is it ties all of this really trippy scriptural stuff to um, um, about the angelic realms, it ties it very closely with practical life, and also our purpose in Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, that, and, that, and that in some sense, uh, what I love about it is no longer is uh, the angelic and the demonic some kind of just weird thing out there, mm-hmm. but all of a sudden, my life hinges on minute decisions I make throughout the day where I turn more toward the angelic. In other words, I become more and more able to recognize the presence and give glory, um, or by the eight, turning away and falling into darkness, which is in a sense sense, an inability to recognize the presence of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my struggle is constantly to be able, throughout my decisions, to be able to become more and more open, receptive, giving praise and glory, not only through my speech, but through what I do, through mm-hmm. love mm-hmm. Um, in that way. Yeah, it's tremendously liberating. Your, your call each day is to turn turn your eyes to the Lord, be appreciative of his glory, his love, his humility. Try to let that radiate out of you. You don't have to change the world. Th- that's it. Like, that's all. Uh, and it, it, Yes, it can be tremendously hard, but that's it. And um, no one can rob you of that. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That's what it is. So... Um, it's, it's that paradox of rooting out pride is very, very hard. At the same time, recognizing mm-hmm. the greatest gift, not only the greatest gift imaginable, it's beyond all imagining, is there for us. We don't have to go achieve these things. It's this free gift. And the fight with pride just so you can turn your mind to that free gift that's within. So, so we're going to be talking a little bit more in terms of wrapping up this series on the passions um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, but that is the culmination of the specific exploration of each one of the passions Mm -hmm. and i hope you guys got a clear sense of why this crowns the eight why this is the most destructive and damaging and how closely it's tied with our um, purpose and our destiny in christ Mm -hmm. Um, and we look forward to having more conversation about it
send us questions Facebook wise and again be patient with yourself when you fight this one it's a hard one mm -hmm. and the Lord will carry you through even if you find yourself you know uh, backsliding so to speak be patient with yourself it's fine the Lord will get you through it yeah so blessings peace of Christ, Christ. we'll see you next week bye bye